God's grace, his mercy, and his peace be multiplied to you in the precious name of his Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. The gospel lesson for this Sunday includes a prayer that Jesus prayed that we are privileged to read about and hear. Probably the most famous prayer that we're aware of is from John chapter 17, our Lord's high priestly prayer before his betrayal and crucifixion. One of these rare times in the Gospels that records a prayer of Jesus. We see three things in Jesus' prayer. We see reverence that Jesus has for God, the Father. He knew that the Father was holy. He too was holy. But he acknowledges God's holiness and reverence. Secondly, Jesus' relationship to God. A relationship of oneness, a relationship of unity. The most haunting words in the Bible for me is when Jesus was on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just think, from all eternity, there had been a unity and a oneness that had never experienced separation. But when Jesus hung on the cross, he paid the price for the sins of the world. He paid the price for your sins and for my sins. And not only did he pay the price for our sins, he experienced hell so that we would not have to experience. Hell is separation from God. In the final judgment, Jesus will say, depart from me. And that's what makes hell so horrible and so awful. It's eternal separation from God's presence and from his love. And thirdly, Jesus rests in the will of God. He came here to do the Father's will. He didn't come here to do the will of some man. He came here to do the Father's will. This is Jesus' first public mention of God as his Father. Now, he talked about this to his disciples previously, but this is the first time that publicly now in ministry, he acknowledges that he and the Father are one. This text is also one of the most striking claims to his sonship. It's found in the Gospel, in the Gospels. He and the Father share a oneness. They share a unity. He certainly became fully man, yet without sin. But he was also God. He was God in the flesh came to do the work of Almighty God. In verse 28, Jesus then says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Gretchen and I talked this week about the times in our lives when we felt heavy laden. We felt the burden upon our backs, and it was crushing. Last Sunday, I told you that when I was in Montgomery, Alabama, and during the liturgy, during the Sanctus, I was just absolutely overwhelmed. I therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name evermore praising the insane. And we burst into the Sanctus. And I raised my hands and I wept. And the retired pastor at that church, the founding pastor, called our district president and said I had a nervous breakdown. But obviously I did not. Uh, but it was some short time after that 
that the same pastor then filed 10 charges of false doctrine against me. I was found not guilty by the leadership of the church. And I was found not guilty by the district as well, the Southern District. You may not ever want me to come back here, a pastor who has 10 charges of false doctrine filed against him. But it was very obvious to me that this man and I were in conflict. And I tried to make peace, and there just wasn't any. Until finally I went to Gretchen, my wife, and I said, I think I need to resign. That was one of the most difficult decisions I had to make in life. We had four young children. One of our members owned a florist business. And I went to him and I said, Vern, I said, I want this to be just between us. But I feel I need to resign so that peace can come to the congregation. And I said, will you hire me? And I need at least this amount of money. And he said, well, let me pray about it and get back with you. And so a couple of days later, he said, I've prayed. And he said, I feel like the Lord wants me to hire you. And I worked for him for a number of months. And I will tell you, after I worked for him, he told me later, he said, the amount of money <laughs> that you told me you needed to be paid in order to support your family and make your house payments was the amount of money my business increased while you worked for me. I thought, God, how wondrous of you. But I thought, oh, I, I may never get a call again as a pastor. And I knew that was God's call on my life, to be an under-shepherd, to be a pastor in a congregation, to bring God's word and his sacraments to his people. And there was a friend who came to visit us, and he said, Bill, I'd like us to go to Charlotte, North Carolina, and visit this church called Resurrection Lutheran Church. And so I went there with him, met the elders, shared with them my story. And a uh, little while later, they extended a call to me. Now, the call that they extended was to become a youth pastor. I knew I wasn't a youth pastor. I told them, I said, if I come as a youth pastor, I'll kill the youth group. They'll die. They'll just die. So I returned the call thinking, God, I'd like to have a call in your church. And when I returned that call and explained why I was doing it, they sent me another call to become an associate pastor. And I accepted that call and was pastored there for over 30 years. I share that story with you because this congregation has been through some hard days, some challenging days, some hurtful days. But I love when Jesus says, come to me, come to me, It was another very traumatic time when Gretchen and I both felt very heavy laden. And when our children were young, one of them was sexually abused. But I want to stand before you and testify to God's faithfulness and his care and his love. 
He cares about this flock. He loves this flock. He wants to bring a shepherd here to this flock. Jesus says he comes to bring rest for your souls. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Henry Blackaby. He's a Baptist Bible teacher. I've never heard of him. And he wrote this Bible study called Experiencing God. And the elders, the pastors and elders at Resurrection looked through this study and we said, this is good. Let's do this for the body here. So we did, we journeyed through this Bible study called Experiencing God. And one of the things that Henry Blackaby says in this study just jumped out at me. He said, God is always at work. And he's always working redemptively. God is at work here at Augustine. And he's working redemptively. And I'll tell you why this jumped out at me so strongly. In the book of Genesis, sin comes on the scene. Satan tempts Adam and Eve tempts Eve and she shares with Adam. And as soon as sin comes on the scene, God promises to send through the seed of the woman, the Messiah, whose heel would be bruised but who would crush the head of Satan. God is always at work and he's always working redemptively. He's doing a redemptive work for you here at Augustana. During this vacancy, be in prayer. Be in prayer for each other. Be in prayer for your new pastor. Be in prayer that God send you a pastor who loves Jesus. A pastor who loves the Word of God. A pastor who loves God's people. I will tell you, since last Sunday, Gretchen and I have prayed for this body of believers. We've prayed for you. And we will continue to do so until God sends you that under shepherd. But know that his hand and his spirit are with you today. He wants to be a God who says, I've yoked you to Jesus. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus was a carpenter? And he talks about this yoke and we are yoked to him. You're not walking through these days alone. God is with you. He has promised, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He's the God who loves you. He's the God who sent Jesus to be your Savior. I don't know how you're doing on your Bible reading, but when Gretchen and I met at St. John's in Winfield, I fell in love with her. Fell in love with her. And then she went on to Concordia Teachers College in River Forest. And I went on to the senior college, Concordia Senior College in Fort Wayne, which is now uh, the seminary. And we would write to each other every day. Do you know what I did? I put a toothpick in my mailbox so I didn't have to do the combination, but just open it and get her love letter. I was so eager to read her love letter. The Bible is God's love letter to you and to me. When you read it, the Spirit of God does a work within you. He has promised that his word will not return to him void. It will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. Whether it's something you're going through personally, or whether it's something this whole body of believers is going through together, God is with you. 
And he said, I'm going to bring you to the other side. I'm going to bless you. That's the kind of God we worship and the kind of God we have. I pray you be blessed in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.